Good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh, hot day. I'm sorry, I'm, if you think I'm showing a bit too much chest here, I do apologise, but I am not going to button my shirt up. It's about 130 degrees out there. We've had some really, really hot days. We're in a heat wave. Woohoo! Hottest since 1977, which I remember very well because I went up to university in the uh, autumn of 1976. So 1977 was my first uh, summer away from home. Oh, and that was halcyon days. So, uh, anyway, how are you? <clears throat> well, I hope. And those uh, more uh, orally astute of you will have noticed I've got a bit of a croak. And that's because for the first two really hot days of the year I've had quite a shocking uh, head cold and <clears throat> not flu or anything but just uh, rhinitis and a buzzy head and God knows, loads of symptoms you don't really want to know about. So. I went to uh, stay in my brother-in-law's hotel over the weekend and uh, it was a, had a nice time. It was had a nice break, you know, and nice to receive an invite like that and it's all expenses paid, you know, and uh, he's got a, quite a decent chef there and so we had two nice evening meals and, but uh, <clears throat> it sort of does ruin it a bit, both for yourself and everybody if you're coughing into a tissue all the time and blowing your nose every five seconds, you know. And uh, in the end the plumbing packed up in the bedroom and uh, and there was no internet there so I couldn't check on the Bitcoin prices so we decided to come back a bit early because I wasn't well. Which is a shame but well as I say we had two, a couple of good nice evenings there but it was followed by a drive well, I was literally just about to go to bed. It was about 10.30 or something, and I was just getting ready to go to bed, and then the, the, all the plumbing packed up in the room, so. <clears throat> and the, the hotel was completely full. So it wasn't a case of moving to a room, a different room or anything. So we had to pack everything up in the car and drive home from Lyme Regis in Dorset to uh, Canterbury in Kent, which is a which is a four-hour trip, and we didn't get back till about. Well, you don't realise it's a fair old bit of traffic in the middle of the night. I mean, I haven't driven back through the night for a long time. You know, some, probably 20 years when the children were young, and we used to do midnight ferries and things like that when we went to France. But uh, now, you know, you know there's more traffic during the day. What you don't realise is that the traffic that you used to have in the day is now the normal traffic at night. So you're travelling with quite a few people at uh, two o'clock in the morning. But then, of course, then that's when they decide to do things like shut the M3 for resurfacing. And um, because it's like a, it's a quick closure, you know, it's like a four hour closure or, a, or a, um, you know, a six hour closure or something. And, um, so they don't really have time or, or the inclination to go and put up any sort of half decent signposts, uh, diversions. So this is where um, the old GPS comes in so brilliantly. And I've got a, we've got a Suzuki, and it has a built-in GPS. But I'd still swear by Google Maps. I wouldn't use the built-in GPS, and you know, in the Suzuki, unless it was the, literally the only one I had. And Google is really is amazing, you know. I mean, I really was amazed by it. it was coming back at from sort of 10:30 to 3:30 in the morning, and there was a vehicle fire on the M25, and it literally took us off the M25 and down some country lanes, you know, literally, and and rooted us just around this vehicle fire and saved us 15 minutes by not piling into the back of a massive grey. A traffic jam on the M25 so it's it's getting to the point now where it's extremely uh, clever you know so <clears throat> I've been out of commission really I've not felt like doing much you know what it's like when you get like a fuzzy head and and which is a shame because I would have liked to have done more 
bearing in mind the weather's been nice, but in the way it's been it's been so nice that uh, it's been so hot that you can't even really go out in it. You know, it's you sort of sit it out in it for a bit and then you think, well, what's the point? You know, what am I? Am I just getting browner and browner and browner? I suppose, but um, anyway. So I've uh, had the Monday off because uh, I, the Monday was booked off anyway because one of our nurses is going to Las Vegas and so we're short staffed and so yesterday we had no uh, nurse, so uh, just a receptionist, so that I kept the surgery open. And um, I was supposed to um, be signing off my accounts which are due on the end of June. And where are we now? It's the 20th, so thanks some time, thanks some time. And we use a system called QuickBooks, which is a, you know, a proper accounting system. Loads of people use Sage. People who don't have to pay the bills use Sage. <laughs> people who do have to um, pay for an, their accounting software use QuickBooks because it's cheaper. Um, at least that was always the case. I mean, QuickBooks then, then got bought out by Intuit, which is a massive great financial corporation now and which jack the price is up now so it's cost several hundred pounds a year to use QuickBooks and it's got a facility in it where you can sort of clone your accounts and send them to your accountant and the idea being that your accountant can then make adjustments to them and um, send back the clone which then gets merged into the master file, master database um, and it's a marvellous system when it works, but it, it's never worked in the UK. By which I mean I've never found an accountant that could do it. It works fine in principle. If they could do it, then it would be a brilliant idea. But um, none of them uh, bother investing in the... Well, a lot of them... I mean, <laughs> you'd be hard-pressed to find an accountant that's got QuickBooks. Let's put it that way. I, I suppose they're used to dealing with Sage. But... Um, QuickBooks for them is just another few hundred pounds that they'd rather not spend. And from what I can work out, most dentists send their accounts to their um, accountants in the shoebox still. So, sorry, desk junction. I have to pay attention. Yes, this is. There's a few places where you're guaranteed instant death. That's one of them, if you pull out in front of a lorry. And there's a certain time on the platform at Addisham Station where uh, there's a fast train that comes straight through. And if you accidentally strayed onto the railway line at that point, <laughs> that'd be the end of everybody. <laughs> and they'd probably only find your teeth. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that'd be morbid. Uh, <coughs> so, the old shoebox uh, technique is the most often used technique to the point where I said uh, to Alan, my accountant, uh, you know, I'm using QuickBooks I'm, and I'm looking for an accountant that can finally, that can use QuickBooks because I got fed up with it. You know, I I use QuickBooks for all these years and I do, I do all the work for them. You know, we put every, we reconcile it with the bank account, we put every... Uh, a, a transaction in, we allocate it, we have management accounts, we, we produce a draft profit and loss and budget uh, balance sheet and everything and then <clears throat> send this disc to the accountant having done pretty much more than most accountants do you know and uh, and then what they do is they then they, they then and it always struck me as extremely unfair they then charge you uh, the same even though you've done all the work. They've, you know, it doesn't matter whether they do the work or you do the work, you get charged the same. This is the basic uh, inequity of it that always really rubbed me up the wrong way. Now I know there, there are tangible benefits to us for doing it and getting the management accounts out because we have, we're far more effective at running the practice and a much better sense of what uh, direction that we're going in and uh, what management decisions need to be made far closer to the time at which they need to be made. You know, you can't be making decisions based on your accounts from a year ago. You know, something happened a year ago and then a year later you find out and so you react. That's far too slow. We we have to react in, we react in real time, which usually means within a month. 
and um, so I mean we do it for our own benefit but it just does annoy me that then you know you just can't find an accountant that will work with you on this and accounting services for dentists I think are, again is something that they're just stuck in the stone age they're stuck in the, the 50s um, and the profession is equally to blame for this I think although accountants probably are primarily to blame because they're not really looking for ways to make this you know I mean for example my my accountant could easily dial into my practice computer and manipulate my accounts in real time and pull off data files in real time and um, and uh, you know participate as a, as a member as a team member and a stakeholder in the success of my business but he doesn't and, and this is the this is the problem with accountants you're you know there's a so many misconceptions about what they do and what they don't do and and sadly so often what they do do is just take your receipts in your shoebox and just put them into some sort of official looking piece of paper some official looking set of accounts which can go into the inland revenue and then tell you how much money you know that you haven't got that you need to pay in tax there's so much scope there for improving that service you know by literally being far more involved in the running of the practice for example I don't know whether they don't do that because they're uh, they don't want to get involved in you know the, the management I don't know whether they they don't they're not proactive they're completely reactive um, they could be saying look you know with someone who's in your situation with your with your um, you know with a business of your type should be considering this or I don't know or you know moving some funds offshore or just uh, spending some coming up you know you've got an excess uh, profit and so it'd be better off if you bought a new OPG uh, in the next sort of two months rather than in the next year or so um, I don't know whether you've got an accountant there. if you've got an accountant who's a cousin then you might have someone that does that but I've never had an accountant that did that and it's a shame because all their financial expertise you know everything that they're prepared to go around the country lecturing about to get new clients is not delivered it's not doesn't come through the pipeline when you sign up they literally sit in the background and just say send us your shoebox we'll send you the accounts and tell you how much you owe the inland revenue so sorry um, you know there's no they could do so much more proactively to try and reduce people's tax bills. <laughs> you, know, you know, you're a dentist. You know how to reduce people's decay rates, and you know how to reduce people's uh, periodontal disease, but you don't know how to mitigate your tax effectively. Your accountant does, but he doesn't tell you. He might drop a few hints from time to time, but he's not. You know, they. There's been a subtle shift in the relationship between dentists and accountants because they used to um, they used to be allied with their clients, and now the inland revenue has sort of forced them to become inland, uh, ally, allied with the inland revenue. And uh, whereas anything you say to your solicitor is in confidence and it's you know it's covered by legal privilege, um, anything you say to your accountant if he suspects that it's in in conflict in any way with the interests of the inland revenue he's he's obliged legally obliged to report it to the inland revenue and that's a very different relationship you know you're you're it's a bit like if you uh, had a solicitor and you uh, said something to the solicitor and the solicitor thought to himself well that would that might indicate that this on balance this person is likely to be guilty of this offence and he then went to the judge and said, um, you know, this my client has said X, Y and Z to me, um, therefore i just got to tell you that on balance I think he's probably guilty. <laughs> you know, it's a completely different relationship. I mean, I know <clears throat> if you are being represented by, a, say, a criminal solicitor or barrister and you do, you say, and you plead not guilty and you then say <coughs> to the barrister <coughs> I want you to get me off this I did actually do this but I want you to get me off the barrister then 
he's put in an impossible position and what he would do or should do is go to the court and say <clears throat> I am in you know my I'm my client has put me in a very difficult position and I want to be uh, sort of recused from the case and he's not he, he's not actually saying in so many words that his client has told him that he is guilty but the court knows that that's why he's asking to be recused because information has come into his possession <laughs> that he's he's putting he's trying to put together a plea of not guilty for a, for a criminal who has quite happily admits that he did do it <clears throat> but your accountant is is in that position he's he's basically he's uh, basically he just sort of I don't know whether their ethical code uh, precludes them from continuing to represent you, but they must go to the Inland Revenue and say, um, I think that uh, my client is, uh, has come up with a, you know, a tax saving scheme <laughs> that's illegal, <laughs> or that he's withholding uh, income, or, you know, or X, Y and Z. <clears throat> so, What's the upshot of that? Well, the upshot of that is that while you can actually uh, talk quite frankly with your solicitor, you cannot talk at all frankly with your accountant. You cannot say, uh, you know, could you come up with a whiz bang scheme to hide some money from the inland revenue? Because not only will he say no and should say no, but he will also say no and I am going to report you to the inland revenue. <laughs> for dis for requesting that, <laughs> for deciding to go up to, to sort of pursue that sort of uh... so you know so and I, I feel sorry for the accountants I think obviously they have to work on building up a relationship with people and <clears throat> I think that they they possibly they haven't addressed they haven't addressed that uh, that issue of uh, with their clients of where they stand on that point you know I mean I, with, with Alan, everything is above board. I mean, as I say, we, we send him our accounts and they're, and they're already pre-done. And so there are very few questions about our income or what we've spent it on, you know. I mean, they, they tend, they are some, some of the most ridiculously, you know, asinine questions, which is basically, can, I think the only question they asked this year was could they have the receipt for any expenditure over 8,000 pounds? And that's because they're going to put it down as capital expenditure rather than uh, revenue expenditure. You know, in-year expenditure. So in-year expenditure, you you can you can claim against your uh, profit in the year in which it's spent. If it's capital expenditure, I think you sort of write it off over several years. Um, I don't see why you should bother. I mean, if you've got you know if you've got the profits to be able to afford to buy something in year, then I don't see why you shouldn't just buy it in year. Because it reduces your tax of all. Uh, I'm, I'm getting into giving accountant advice here, so I'm not going to bother. But no, I don't know. If I said, you know, if I said, perhaps that's a conversation I, I need to have with Alan and say to him, look, you know, what's the situation now with discussing issues? You know, what's what are your obligations as regards uh, reporting what we discuss with the unknown revenue? And see what he says. He might he might just say no. Look, Derek, I know you know. Technically, we have an obligation, but in practice, you know, in my 35 years of being an accountant, we've never done it. You know, and you'd have to be you'd have to be like Starbucks or something <laughs> to to qualify to get reported. Uh, you know, or some sort of a, a, a Division One footballer or disc jockey. don't think I'll ever be in that league so anyway I'm going to try and uh, do my accounts today so basically it consists of comparing my accounts now uh, with the version of the accounts that I gave him um, six months ago just to see if anything's changed see I don't even know whether we can I mean I could say to him just bang those accounts in and then if anything does turn up later we'll just change them but I don't know if I can change them can I I don't know like there's no they're so poor at communicating you know they're like the lab lab technicians 
they've got a mass they've got a fantastic service that could be improved so much and they don't sell themselves and so they're doing and which is a shame because they're in the business of making money you know they make their own money if they can make you profitable then you can pay them more <laughs> they, could, they could do so well <laughs> Okay, well, I hope you like your accountant, because you need to, okay? And uh, I'm going to sort of try and get through today, and hopefully this uh, shift the, this cold. But it's a lovely day, and uh, I'll uh, talk to you tomorrow. Bye.